All right, so welcome to lecture three. Today, we're really going to dive into curve fitting and what we mean by chi-squared and other measures of statistical quality of fit. And let me remind you just the path we've taken so far. So imagine that there's some real model of the world, and the real model of the world predicts that there is some relationship between some, some independent variable that you adjust with a knob and some dependent variable, some measurement that you're making. And let's say that that model of the world is some line with some slope and some intercept. And you pick a bunch of points. And for each, each point you pick, you make a measurement. And due to lots of different sources of error, um, each measurement tends to be drawn from some probability distribution. Hopefully, it's centered around the true, the true model of the, the world. Um, and if it weren't, then that would be a uh, systematic error that's not covered in, in this discussion. So this discussion assumes that you, you draw some random variable and it is, on average, you'll get the right answer, but due to various inaccuracies, fluctuations, noise, electrical, whatever, um, each, each data point that you, you measure will be drawn from some distribution. And imagine we're, we're making, let's say we're making five measurements at each point. So you'll get five points, one, two, three, four, five here. and five points here, one, two, three, four, five, and five points here, one, two, three, four, maybe there's an outlier, one, two, three, four, five, you'll get a one, two, three, four, five, and et cetera, et cetera. Let me just draw. So this, this data is too, too good probably, uh, but the, the point is that if there are seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, nine, uh, nine different knob positions, in each knot position, you draw five points. Um, each of those points is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. Now, the Gaussian distribution, or well, each of those points is drawn from some distribution. Uh, and if that distribution is a source of lots and lots of errors, um, it'll tend to be Gaussian-ish. But uh, that each each point will have some some mean, hopefully centered around the true uh, the true model. Let's call this uh, what do I call it here a a true plus some slope b true times x. That's the, the equation for this, this line. And there'll be some spread. And the true spread in, in each draw is called sigma. This is the true, true standard deviation. And uh, what you will calculate is the, the, the sample mean and the sample standard deviation for each point, and, and we talked about that last time. And again, this, this, uh, this true standard deviation can be different for each, each point. So say in some places you, you uh, turn the knob and it's, it's very noisy and you get a huge spread. In other places you turn the knob and it's not very noisy and you get a very small spread. So the true standard deviation that you're drawing from could be different for each point. And you'll calculate the sample standard deviation, S, at each point sample standard deviation at each point. And remember, this is, this is the formula with the n minus 1. And you'll also calculate the, the sample mean. So y bar sub i is the sample mean. And the thing you really want to know for this fit is how far is my mean away from what I, what I expect. Or, or if I were to take these five points and calculate a mean, and then I were to keep the knob at the same spot, take another five measurements, calculate the mean, keep the knob at the same spot, take another five measurements, calculate the mean, what would be the distribution of those means? And that those means have some, some distribution. And the distribution of each of those means is called the standard error, the standard error of the mean. So that, that we call sigma of y bar, and again, that can depend on, on where you are. So this is standard error of, of the mean. And this, just to remind you, this is just si over square root of n. And I actually proved that last time, where n is five here for taking five measurements. All right, so that's the kind of data taking step. Now, separate from all this, we 
the plot that we actually make to, to show is, is we, we plot each of these sample means. So let me draw my nine, my nine places here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We plot a standard mean and we plot the standard error of the mean as error bars that go plus and minus uh, on each of those points. So let's say that the point here, maybe it has bigger errors, a point here, small errors, a point here, has big errors, a point here, small errors. And so this is the, this is the plot of y bar plus or minus sigma y bar. And today we're gonna to talk about how, how you fit a line and how you get the best fit line. Because the line you're going to fit is not necessarily this true ax plus b, you're gonna fit some other line and hopefully the parameters are close, but we wanna determine how, how, uh, how to get these parameters and how close they are. Um, and from now on, we'll, we'll just drop all of the, you know, the fact that each of these is composed of five individual measurements. We don't need to know that anymore. We've already taken all that into account in this plot where we plot the, the mean at each point and we plot the, the standard error of the mean. Because uh, this, this tells you how, how well you've measured each of these means. If, you, if instead of making five measurements, you make 500 measurements, then uh, each measurement of the mean should be better by a factor of square root of 100. It should be 10 times smaller. Uh, so if you're willing to spend 100 times longer on each point, uh, your error bars are going to be 10 times smaller, and you should get a better fit. But all that information is already contained in this plot or in this set of data, the, the, the set of means and the set of standard errors on the mean. And now we're going to go on to the curve fitting part. So uh, let me just say that we're, I'm going to call this thing here. So in order to keep it general, so we're, we're doing an example of a line, but in order to keep it general, I'm going to call this f some f of x. And what I want to write down is I want to write down the uh, I want to write down a probability for uh, for various lines. Fitting. Uh, how do I want to say that? Um, okay. So, what what do we mean by the best fit line? What we mean is, we're going to try a whole bunch of different lines, and we're going to ask the question for a particular line. What is the probability that for this particular line, if I were to go through this procedure and make uh, make measurements of the mean of five points and the standard error on those means, for that particular line that I've hypothesized, what is the probability that I would have gotten that particular y bar for this, uh, for this data point? And the probability that I would have gotten that particular y bar for that data point, and the probability that I would have gotten that particular y bar for that data point. And so for a particular line, the probability, probability of, uh, of drawing this data from this particular guess is, so this is the probability of y bar one, probability, uh, oops, comma, y bar two, y bar two, y bar three, all the way up to here, let's call it y bar sub m. So m is nine in this example, I've drawn nine different independent points. Um, I've, sorry, I, I made measurements at nine different uh, knob positions. And there's an assumption here that all of the errors that we're drawing, if they're statistical in nature rather than systematic in nature, all the statistical errors are independent of each other. So whatever, whatever weird electrical noise I had here, when I move over here, I'll get a different incarnation of that weird electrical noise. And here I'll get a different incarnation of that weird electrical noise. And so assumption is gonna be that each of the, at each of these places, even though the sources of error might, might be the same, as long as it's random statistical error that's pushing me around randomly, uh, the, the particular, whether I got pushed a little bit higher, a little bit low is gonna be, is gonna be independent 
uh, at each at each point. And so that we could take our our joint probability, the probability that I drew this point and that point and that point and that point and that point, and, that point, and turn it into a product. So this is the probability that I drew this this point times the probability that I drew the next point, or at least the probability density, probability I drew this point y three dot 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 all the way up to y bar m, the last point. And because each of these points is constructed by taking the average of a bunch of different independent measurements, uh, even if these independent measurements were not strictly distributed as Gaussians, which usually they are because they themselves are made up of independent measurements, independent sources of error, even if each of these draws was not distributed as a Gaussian, when you're taking the average of five, you're already getting into central limit theorem territory where uh, the average of five things even if they're not individually distributed Gaussian, tends to be pretty distributed, pretty Gaussianly distributed. And what is the what is the the width of that Gaussian? Well, the width of that Gaussian is this sigma y bar for each point. That was the that was the reason why we constructed it that way. So let me write this as a product of of probabilities for uh, uh, probabilities that are Gaussians with that particular sigma. So let me write this as a product from m equals one up to capital M of a bunch of Gaussians. And that is gonna be one over square root of two pi uh, sigma y bar sub m. That's the kind of prefactor. E to the minus uh, well, how far are we off from what we expect? Well, for a particular um, for a particular guess, so this is this is a line. This is a guess. So let's just call this a uh, plus b x. This is our our uh, our guess of parameters. Uh, I'm just going to call this f of x in general. This is our guess for particular parameters. It's going to be y bar sub m minus what we expect for if, if this line was the true, uh, the, the true model of nature. So minus f of x sub m, all of that squared divided by two sigma y bar sub m squared. So this is just a product of drawing individual probabilities. Now, of course, you have a product of, of Gaussians that's, that's going to be pretty small, but we're not asking what the, we don't actually care what the actual probability for drawing this particular set of points is. What we want to do is we want to find the best fit line, or in general, the best fit curve here. And to find the best fit curve, we define that best curve as the curve that maximizes this probability. What is the curve that makes it the most likely that we got we drew this particular uh, this particular point here, and we drew that particular point there, and that particular point there, and that particular point there. So, so what we want to maximize, or what we want is we want to maximize this. So best best fit maximizes this joint joint probability. So. And imagine trying all kinds of different A's and trying all kinds of different B's and finding the one that maximizes the probability that for that particular A and that particular B, you, you drew this data. Uh, but that's the same, that's equivalent to, equivalent to minimizing something that's gonna be made of stuff up here. So I'm going to call this chi-squared. I'll write what chi-squared is, and you'll see why it's equivalent in a second. So first of all, notice that all of these prefactors here, they don't depend on the fit parameters. So as, as we change A and B to try to maximize this joint probability, these prefactors aren't, aren't dependent on A and B. They're just going to factor out of this overall product. And because these have this nice Gaussian form and this exponential, a product of these exponentials all uh, all ends up adding up to a single thing. So let me call, let me just define this as some prefactor uh, 
some constant that doesn't depend on a and b times e to the minus chi squared. And let me just write explicitly what chi squared is. And I'm going to erase my uh, my scatter plot here. Uh, Jason, a question in the chat here of, do we mean to call both the true line and the guess line f of x? Uh, maybe I should have called the true line f true. Unfortunately, I just erased it. So yeah, I could also, I could also put guess, 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 guess here. Uh, I've got a look, you know, on the text is a little cut off in the bottom of the screen for minimizing chi squared. Oh, equivalent. This is equivalent to. This is equivalent. Equivalent to minimizing this thing called chi squared, which if we write it like this, there's some constant prefactor that doesn't depend on the parameters. So when we start you know, taking derivatives or whatever to minimize this joint probability or to, to maximize this joint probability, this prefactor is not going to not going to depend on a and b. a and b or any other parameters of your curve are going to be in there. So let me just write down what chi squared is. So chi squared is, um, is just the sum of all the things in this, in this exponent. It's the sum from m equals 1 to capital M of what you measure for your, your y bar, the, you know, the average of that particular point minus the guess that you've made f uh, I'll just call it f of x of m all of that stuff squared divided by two sigma y bar sub m so 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 what is this sort of physically well you're and, and this is the thing you want to minimize so you want to pick your parameters to minimize the squared distance to the, the data that you've actually measured in units of sigmas. So in units of how far oh, sigma squared. So the squared distance, squared distances in units of sigma squareds. So the closer this, this line is to the point that you measure, the smaller this distance is. But if you have particular data with huge error bars, um, it doesn't matter if, if a point is really far off, if it has huge error bars. I didn't really draw any points with huge error bars, but uh, you can imagine this point that was way up here, if it happened to have bigger error bars, it's okay that it's farther away uh, because, because it has big error bars. And so this kind of intuitively says, well, you wanna minimize the square distance from the data we have to the function that we're guessing in units of error bars. Um, and this answers the question that you may have had if you've ever done data analysis before, which is when we, when we do these things, we often do least squared fits. Why is it the least squared? Why not minimize the absolute, absolute distance or the distance to the fourth or something? Why the squared? So ultimately, that has to do with the fact that each of these points is made up of an average of a bunch of points. And that central theorem says that these things are Gaussian distributed. And what we really mean by a best fit is the fit that maximizes some real probability distribution. And because of the central limit theorem, these are Gaussians and Gaussians have this squared form. That's where we get a least, least squared fit from as opposed to uh, you know, just minimizing the, the distance. Um, okay, so let me, let me say that uh, there are two ways we could proceed here. One way is if we have a line, for example, a, a plus bx, we could plug in a plus bx to this expression. And now we just have some algebraic expression, right? That, that's literally just a, uh, some complicated, messy thing involving a and b. And if we have a line, we could start taking derivatives and ask, you know, set the, setting the derivatives equal to zero and solving for a and b. And that you get a nice closed form solution, at least, you know, in terms of kind of linear algebra uh, matrix operations, you get a nice closed form solution for, for a and b. It's not particularly 
uh, clean, but uh, you, you could you could plug in A and B and start taking derivatives and get a nice closed form solution. Um, that is not what we are actually going to use because we want to allow curves to curves that aren't just lines. Uh, so, so what we'll actually do is we'll use the Python package that does the numerical numerical minimization, where it uh, you you give it the ability to calculate chi squared for any arbitrary parameters of whatever curve you choose to fit, and it will uh, adjust those parameters to try to minimize this this chi squared, uh, and it will spit back the the results of that minimization. Okay, so I heard, I heard for a second. Link. Yes. Um, I know that there's the factor of two that's in in the Gaussian um, probability density function, but doesn't the, does the chi squared definition normally drop that factor of two? Uh, you are correct. So I should have I should have put over two here, and I should have erased over two here. Yeah, you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. I would have I would have run into that problem in, on the next page here. So. So for let me just say for for a line, for f of x equals a plus b x, we could literally calculate partial chi squared, partial a, and set it set it equal to zero, and partial chi squared, partial b, set it equal to zero, and get some closed form expressions for a and b, and of course those closed forms deter depend on each of the points here and each of the, the standard errors of the points. Um, but let's, let's just talk about uh, how, well, I'll, I'll give some examples in, in Python in a second, kind of going through a little bit of what you'll do in the homework. But let's talk about, at the end of the day, how do you measure statistically whether your, your fit was a reasonably good fit or not? And that has to do with looking at chi squared, the value of chi squared at the place that's best. So, so now there's some, uh, so this is chi squared for, for any, any guess of f of x, uh, you know, for any, any parameters a and b. And then there's the chi squared that's that's the best chi squared. So, uh, and unfortunately, these are all just called chi squared. So, you have to be a little bit careful. So, for for the best fit parameters, for the for the best best fit parameters, there's there's something called chi chi squared. Uh, itself, so chi squared. This is, you know, you could call it uh, uh, chi squared. So this is the minimum minimum chi squared, or the best best chi squared. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this is just usually called chi squared. What is chi squared for your your particular fit? And for that, you just actually take your your uh, your data and you subtract the the model that you would get with the best parameters square that divide by the by the error at each point and then sum up all those points and what we want to know is what what should we expect for this right this is some measure for how far off the data is from your model and we want to know properties of this of this value so let me let me let me pause there and take questions about this whole procedure before I talk about properties of this chi squared thing. Uh, text was a little cut off on the screen. Oh, okay. So, all right. So I'm going to erase this this pink stuff here, but I'm going to keep this picture up. So. Anything that comes to mind as I'm erasing this, please, please shout it. Oh, for some reason this is particularly difficult to erase. So you have plenty of time to ask questions. Why is it called chi squared? What does the chi itself represent? 
Um, the same reason why we tend to deal with in mathematically the variances, the sigma squareds tend to behave more nicely than the sigmas themselves. So I think the reason why it's called chi squared rather than just some other variable is that uh, it's it's sort of like a, well it's it's very well it's analogous to uh, a standard deviation where if you have a bunch of independent in, independent things and you want and you add them together say uh, let me say we talked about this a little bit last time if if we have a bunch of independent variables and we form the average of a bunch of a bunch of things right you you can ask if each variable is drawn from some distribution with some variance and you average them together the average of the variances is meaningful but the variance of the average is the average of the variances that's not true of the standard deviations so the things that kind of come in in this form of the squares those tend to add together nicely and give you something meaningful but just like we you know we often don't have a separate name for the variance even though that's the thing that adds together nicely we just call that sigma squared or s squared or something same thing here we don't have we're never actually going to deal with with chi itself. We're almost always going to deal with chi squared. So we could have given that some other name, but kind of in analogy with a standard deviation, we, we just call the thing that we actually care about, which is more like a variance, we just call that chi squared. I don't know, does that help? It's maybe other people have insights into this. This is more of a notational thing. Uh, you know, in some sense, the calling this Obsessing about sigma is nice because sigma has the same units as the thing you're measuring. Right? So if you're measuring a bunch of lengths for y, then sigma has the units of length. Sigma squared has units of length squared. That's not always as easy if I were to report you know, 100 meters squared rather than 10 meters. I think if given that you measured a bunch of things in meters, it makes much more sense to report the 10 meters. Now, chi squared is dimensionless. So the, the, that advantage is not exactly there. Like with whatever dimensions this has up here, this has the same thing. So uh, I can't use that justification. I, I think the justification is much more that it's kind of like a, a standard deviation versus a variance. And, and we want to talk about the variances now. Uh, okay. So let's let's ask what what you expect chi squared to be. Well, kind of on average. And, and here I've, I've drawn data that's way, way too good. On average, you expect these things to be about a standard deviation away from the line. And maybe the more precise statement is that 68% of these points should be within one standard deviation of the line. And the remainder should be more than one standard deviation away. But you know, the statement is that kind of on average these are about a, a standard deviation away if if this is a good model for the data and if each of these is on average about a standard deviation away then and and you have capital m of them then you expect chi squared to be somewhere somewhere around m on average now we can get a little bit more precise about that and that's where the chi-squared distribution comes in. So some of you have already plotted this chi-squared distribution on the homework. And let me just give you a definition for this chi-squared distribution, at least in you know, the, the, the version that we're going to use. So uh, let's say I'll call this the chi-squared distribution. distribution. So the definition here is that uh, you start with, start with, uh, with, with uh, Z1, Z2, all the way up to Z sub M drawn from the standard normal distribution. So 
So that means mean, mean zero, uh, sigma one. And you form, form chi squared of these as just the sum of the squares. So Z1 squared plus Z2 squared plus dot, 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 all the way up to Z sub M squared. Now, the, the chi squared, chi squared distribution is the distribution of these, these chi squareds. So imagine doing this a bajillion times. You, you take, say, nine, nine draws from a standard normal distribution. You add their squares together, and, and you plot that on a histogram. And you do that again, and you plot it. You do it again, and you plot it, and do it again, and plot it. Now, the central limit theorem says that in the limit where m is enormous, it should eventually converge on a Gaussian. But we don't usually work in the limit where m is enormous. We work in the limit where m is you know, 10-ish. And it doesn't quite look like a Gaussian yet. So we actually have to worry about the actual distribution for some finite number of these sums. Now, each of the Zs, if it, since it's drawn from a standard normal distribution, it's just as likely to be positive as negative. But once you square them, these are all going to be positive. So we, we're adding up a bunch of positive numbers, because they're all squares, to get a positive number. And just and, and note that the distribution of these chi squareds is going to depend on how many you pick, right? So if I, uh, if I uh, yeah, if, if I were if I were to to pick only a few, then chi squared is going to have a distribution that's pretty low. And if I were to pick a lot here, uh, the distribution of chi squared is going to be pretty high. And here, m is here, M is called the degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom of this distribution. And let me share my screen and show you what these distributions look like, just from the Wikipedia page. All right. So can you all see the Wikipedia screen here? Can anybody yes. see the Wikipedia screen? Yes. Okay. All right, the screen sharing doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't always work perfectly. Um, okay, so this is the chi-square distribution. And let's, let's look, you know, starting at some reasonable value here, like three here. So this blue line is, is the chi-square distribution with three degrees of freedom. And the, the dark blue line is with four degrees of freedom, six degrees of freedom, nine degrees of freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not obvious because these distributions have such a long tail. But if you look at the, the light blue line here, the average of this distribution is in fact three, right? The peak is not at three, but because it has such a long tail, the average is, is about three. So these, this is called the chi-square distribution with, with k degrees of freedom. And this is what you would get if you did this procedure where you drew k independent variables from a standard normal distribution, uh, added their squares up, and plotted, plotted that on a histogram. OK, back to the screen. This is constructed in such a way that because we're dividing by the, the sigma squared here, we are effectively drawing, drawing means from a Gaussian distribution that should be centered around the, the best fit line here. And uh, in order to compensate for the fact that we're not drawing from the standard normal distribution with sigma equals one, we're drawing from a distribution with some other other mean, we're subtracting off the mean we expect. And in order to compensate from the fact that we're uh, not drawing from a distribution with sigma equals one, but with sigma equals what we measured here, say, you know, this with this standard error of the mean, we're going to divide by that. And uh, 
the distribution of this chi-squared should be very similar to the distribution of this chi-squared. Now there's one caveat here, which, which is the following. And it's, it's just like the fact that when we calculated the, the uh, sample variance, we didn't divide by n, we divided by n minus one because there was some, uh, the actual mean was a little bit biased. Let, let me motivate the following. If we happen to have a bunch of data where the, the true line was, was supposed to be down here, let's say, let's imagine that this is the true, true line, but all of our data just happened to be high, just by you know, statistical chance, the best fit of that line is going to get pulled to be a little high. And so the, uh, the difference between where our points lie and where the true line is, is going to be bigger than where our points lie and where our best fit is, because it's been pulled a little bit. And so uh, what that means is that if we were to calculate chi-squared with the true line, this is, is distributed um, as the chi-square distribution with the full m degrees of freedom. But if we were to calculate chi-squared with our fit, this is distributed as the chi-square distribution with, um, I think I called it M minus P degrees of freedom, where P, where P is the number of fit parameters. So it's because you're, you're not comparing your means to the true line, but you're comparing them to the, a line that's been pulled a little bit in whatever direction you happen to, to take data. Um, this this chi-squared that you get from your best fit is, is still distributed as the chi-squared distribution. You can still make a histogram of it and it'll still look exactly like it should. But as you saw on the Wikipedia page, there are different histograms for, I see this is a little bit off screen here, P is. P is distributed. Uh, I'll make a histogram, but it'll be a histogram that matches the one for m minus p degrees of freedom. So in this case of a line, there are two degrees of freedom, two parameters, a and b, the slope and the intercept. And uh, by changing the slope and changing the intercept, you can always get a little bit closer to the particular set of data you've taken as compared to the true data. Uh, and so you will, uh, your, your chi-squared will be distributed uh, will end up being a little bit smaller. And so uh, there are two ways of quantifying this. One way is to look at the chi-squared of your fit. So chi-squared of your fit and divide by the number of effective degrees of freedom and minus P, this should be on average pretty close to one. And you'll, you'll show in the homework that yes, on average, if you do this procedure you know, a million times or however many I ask you to do it, on average for a random fit, this, this with this correct denominator is, is about one. And that's a good measure for uh, if, if your points are really far off the line, then this number here is gonna be way bigger than one. And if your points are suspiciously close to the line in terms of numbers of, uh, numbers of error bars, then this number is gonna be really really tiny. Um, either way, you, you did something wrong in terms of estimating your, your error bars. Uh, and then the last thing is, since you know how this should be distributed, you can look up in the distribution, how, how likely was it that I got the particular value of chi-squared that I actually got? And you get uh, a probability, a probability that someone else doing this experiment would have gotten a chi-squared that's bigger than what you got. And that probability is a number between zero and one. And you want that probability to be 
sort of in the center of the range. And you'll, you'll see that on the homework too. So I'm already a little bit over, over time here. Uh, so let me, let me stop and ask questions. I, I know people probably have to get going. I think I talked a little bit more in the beginning than I meant to. But are there, are there questions about the sort of theory here uh, before you dive into the lab this week, which will be all about fitting and calculating these chi-squares and showing how they're distributed the way I claim, just based on random, uh, random simulation data? Um, so then for chi squared equals z sub one squared plus z sub two squared so forth, mm -hmm. are z is supposed to be like at each standard deviation, like we're 68%, 97%, et cetera, or? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. So this, this would be, if you were to simulate this, you would pick a z from a, drawn from a standard normal distribution, pick another z, pick another z, add up all their squares, to calculate chi squared and then set that aside, put that into a histogram somewhere. Do that again, do that again and again and again and again. And the histogram of all these chi squareds should look like the thing I showed on mm -hmm. Wikipedia. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Or? So it's just by just taking values from the standard normal distribution then. Right. So I'm not, there's nothing in okay. here that's that's about 68% or anything. I'm just doing okay. this procedure over and over and over again. To, I wasn't too sure about how to select it, that's why. Jason, can you okay. say what what is a z? Maybe that would help. Yeah. What, what is a z? It is a number drawn from the standard normal distribution. That is what a z is. Did, did you have something different in mind to that question? I, I mean, is that is that relevant? Because basically, the things that you're summing in the definition of chi squared, those would be like a z is going to be a y minus f over sigma squared. Ah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. So. So to bring it back to our, you know, the chi-squared that we're actually using from, from our data rather than the sort of mathematical uh, sidebar here. Yeah, each z, if you're drawing a number from a standard normal distribution, it has mean zero and sigma one. If you form this thing, y minus f divided by sigma, that also has mean zero and standard deviation one. So, so these z's here in this, Sort of mathematical sidebar definition are analogous to uh, uh, the z's that we're forming here. So each z sub m is. Let me just say, I, I don't know how to, I don't know what to say here. Is analogous to y bar sub m minus your model over. Sigma. That's why this mathematical sidebar was relevant for this. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank okay, you. yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bresnay, for forcing me to be a little bit more clear on that. What are fit parameters? What are fit parameters? You said P is the number of fit parameters. So in the line, the fit parameters would be A and B. So if, if I was fitting a parabola, I would have A, B, and C. So there would be three parameters and for an arbitrary parabola. So, um, so A and B are fit parameters, but chi-squared is a best fit parameter? No, chi-squared is how far you are from the best fit. OK, when you wrote for the best fit parameters, chi-squared, uh, you wrote those three chi-squareds. Oh, for, for the best fit parameters, this, this is true. And then- Oh, okay. I, I said, when we find the best fit parameters, chi right. squared is best. Okay, thank you. Right. So I guess maybe I should have, I could have called this chi squared fit for the best fit parameters, but no one calls it that. People just call it chi squared. So I'm sort of going back and forth between distinguishing different versions of this and using the standard, uh, standard nomenclature, which I realize is confusing because there are lots of different chi squared type things here. So I apologize for that. Uh, let me 